Lake Superior in North America, the largest freshwater surface in the world, paralyzingly cold in summer and plagued by terrifying autumn storms. We had 30 foot seas. I mean, it's like a three and a half story building. You know you're gonna die. Hundreds of ships have sunk here. Most famous, the Edmund Fitzgerald, the Titanic of the Great Lakes, a freighter deemed invincible. You see that, that scallop effect? You wouldn't build a, a ship that way today. There were no survivors and no witnesses, just a wreck that was split in two. Completely shredded. It's like no man's land. Three decades later, father and son diver explorers, Mike and Warren Fletcher, investigate what happened. It's brutal. And new science about freak waves may finally lay the Edmund Fitzgerald to rest. This had to have happened very near the end. I think we're ready to go. I'm good. Clear. Looks like a nice morning. Yeah, it's approximately 25 mile run. Okay. Lake Superior is one of the world's largest freshwater lakes, 560 kilometers east to west. It's a place of extremes, a place where icy polar air hits warm, wet southern winds in a violent collision that can create a superstorm. Nearly 300 ships have sunk there, so the massive freighters working the busy shipping lanes are built to withstand the tempests. On June the 7th, 1958, more than 10,000 people turned out to see the launch of a Leviathan. The Edmund Fitzgerald was the biggest, fastest bulk carrier on the Great Lakes. More than two city blocks long and eight stories high, she was the largest man-made object ever launched into fresh water. But on the 10th of November, 1975, she sank during a violent storm. All 29 crew on board perished. She went down so fast, there was no time for a mayday call. And when she was eventually found, she was broken in half, her hull shredded. An official US Coast Guard inquiry suggested that human error had been to blame. It said hatch covers had not been properly secured, leading to the ship taking on water and sinking, then likely breaking in two when she hit the bottom. The general consensus is the vessel filled with water, for whatever reason, flooded. The bow probably hit bottom first, and it was in that, that position or attitude for some time. And then the sea action and the weight of the ship broke it. But recent sonar scans suggest something different. The positioning of the ship in two distinct halves indicates she may have split in two before she went down. I wonder if we can't shift the thinking to this, to this other possibility, and that is that the Fitzgerald flexed and broke open on the surface and flooded simply because her hull broke in half and, of course, ended up in two pieces. A huge freighter breaking up on the surface sounds incredible, but it happened before. Nine years earlier, in another November storm, just 350 kilometers away on another great lake called Huron. But there was one big difference. That ship, the Daniel J. Morrell, had a survivor. Dennis Hale is now going back to the scene for the first time. When the Morrell sank in 1966, Hale was a 26-year-old crewman. This is gonna be a, a good thing for me. Yeah. I think I need this for my own mental health, if nothing else. Yeah. Hale spent years recovering from his experience. He'd been asleep in his bunk in the bow of the Morel when he was woken by a terrifying sound. The outside temperature was near freezing,
but Hale ran on deck wearing just a peacoat over his underwear and realized that the noise had been his ship breaking in two. Hale pulled on a life jacket and swam to an open life raft with three other men. She's directly under our feet right now. He was rescued 38 hours later in the middle of a blizzard, semi-conscious and delirious, next to three ice-clad frozen figures, the sole survivor in a crew of 29. When I first saw the, the raft, no one was on it. And then uh, when, by the time I got to it, two other men had climbed aboard. Uh, right away, I grabbed the flares and, and fired off a parachute flare. When the flare went out, the other guys remained laying down. I noticed kind of a little glitter out of my left eye. It was this uh, huge wave. It had to be at least 30, 35 feet. I thought, this is going to come down on us and, and kill us, you know? And we had those waves most of the night. Dennis Hale's eyewitness testimony is a starting point for the Fletchers. I'm really looking forward to diving and getting to the point where the ship actually broke apart. Structural failure was blamed for the sinking of the Morel. The Fletchers planned to compare the damage on Hale's ship to the Fitzgerald. Similarities could suggest the Fitzgerald also broke up on the surface, which means hatches and human error may not have been to blame. Diving the Great Lakes is very different from warm water scuba diving. The water here is just seven degrees above freezing and will lower a diver's core temperature. Their neoprene dry suits are four millimeters thick, but the pressure at these depths compresses them to half that, reducing insulation. So they wear four layers of thermals and fleece under their dry suits to try to hold on to body heat during their 60 meter descent to the Morel's bow section. The wreck has been on the bottom for over 40 years, preserved by the cold fresh water. There's always a different feeling knowing you're diving on a wreck where there still could be bodies inside. We need to see the fracture point, but can't forget that this is a graveyard. On the surface, Hale holds the guideline tied to the morel his first physical connection to the ship in over 40 years. Fear is a terrible thing. It drives you to places you don't want to be, you know, in your mind. Just imagine all of a sudden this turning into a raging sea. Just totally unbelievable. A late autumn storm on these lakes is called the Witch of November. Temperatures can drop below freezing, winds can reach hurricane force, and freak waves can exceed 16 meters. When the cauldron is stirred, no ship is safe. The Edmund Fitzgerald was the largest ship ever to lose its battle against the Witch. When the Edmund Fitzgerald uh, sank, it, it... It's like my ship sank all over. I went through all these same emotions. Uh, there were times that I, I would think about it and bring, just bring a shiver to me, think of those guys in the cold and uh, my concern for them. The Fitzgerald lies 160 meters below surface, a gravesite where diving is forbidden. But her bell was recovered, and every year it tolls for the men of that ship once for every lost soul. On the afternoon of Sunday, November 9th, 1975, the freighter set sail from Burlington Northern Railroad Dock in Superior, Wisconsin. There were 29 men aboard, fathers, sons, and husbands. The freighter was loaded with taconite, reddish-brown pellets of low-grade iron ore. It was headed for the steel mills of Detroit a journey of over a thousand kilometers that would take around 47 hours. Loading had gone smoothly, and by early afternoon, the crew was clamping closed the 21 cargo hatches.
Bruce Lee Hudson was one of the men whose job was to clamp down the hatches that day. He'd been a crewman on the Edmund Fitzgerald for over seven months. He loved shipboard life so much, he was thinking of signing up as a cadet at the Great Lakes Maritime Academy. Bruce was an only child. His family heard about the tragedy from a newscast. Nine years earlier, Dennis Hale had also been a 20-something crewman on a Great Lakes freighter, the Morel, a ship split in two by the witch's fury. Today, the lake is calm. 60 meters below, the Fletchers search for the breakpoint where the Morel broke in half on the lake's surface. They look for key signs of structural damage to compare to the Edmund Fitzgerald as they investigate if that ship also broke up on the surface. They examine the torn steel and twisted decking at the breakpoint of the Morel, ripped apart at her cargo holds near the center of the ship. It's roughly the same place that the Fitzgerald broke into. It's shocking that the power of the waves during the winter storm was able to split the morale right in half and do it while she was running on the surface. Well, Dennis, I know I'm nowhere near as cold as you were, but I'm cold. <laughs> At one point, I was wondering whether I wanted to stay down and finish my decompression or just come out and face the consequences. <laughs> it's brutal. It's absolutely brutal down there. To look at her on the bottom today, you don't get the sense that that boat broke in half in a storm. No. Well, the only part that really gets damaged is the center, though. Yeah. The last I saw of her, the, the steering pole was out of the water. <laughs> The last chapter of the Morel is known only because of Dennis Hale. There were no survivors from the Fitzgerald. She went down with all hands. Diving on her is prohibited, protected by law with a $1 million fine for anyone who breaks it. But the men's families still grieve and many of them are reluctant to talk to outsiders. One man believes he knows why. Raymond Ramsey is one of the few surviving members of the team that designed and built the Edmund Fitzgerald. He says families of the victims were offered a cash settlement not to sue. The idea was to hush up these people and they will not go and try and make for a big claim with the owners of the ship. It's all about go, go, go. Is that the case with these big ships? And no, 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 when it comes to spending a lot of money on maintenance. I arrived just when the Chaldee Bradley went down. And there were other ships in that history, Morel, you name it. Mm -hmm. And I said, doesn't anyone get concerned these ships may not be strong enough? His answer to me was, don't worry about it. Not once was the mention of the human life. And that bothered me. The official U.S. Coast Guard inquiry concluded that cargo hatches had not been closed properly, allowing massive amounts of water to flood the Fitzgerald's hold and sink her, a controversial finding that effectively blamed the crew. I guess these just go on. I was thinking they actually bolted them down, but they probably go on and then snap to close like this. The crew of the Edmund Fitzgerald would have been knowingly risking their own lives by not fastening the hatches. So the team want to know what today's Great Lakes sailors believe. Captain Brandon Durant has spent much of his 15-year career on Lake Superior. As far as them finding that the hatches weren't dogged down properly, um, you don't head into any storm without even sending people around to redog the hatches or to check it. As the Fitzgerald left harbor on November the 9th, the water was calm. Storms were forecast for the following day, 
but Superior is so big, she's like an inland ocean. And every captain knows she makes her own weather. November's the worst month. Do you, do you have days where you just don't go? You are at times under pressure to move and to maximize uh, profit. You are pressured that uh, seasickness of certain people shouldn't be a factor, or you are under pressure with which to make the millionaires their money. Uh, but then you're also pressured that in doing that, you have to protect their assets and their people here. This freighter is the same type as the Fitzgerald and carrying the same cargo, iron ore. Today, she's sailing some of the same waters. Her sonar reveals they are directly over the wreck. So we're really close to the Fitzgerald right now. Right. Oh, kind of a weird feeling. Yeah, we're just 500 feet. 500 feet between you and that ship. Definitely uh, a good thing to respect the family and the, and the guys that are down there. At 7 a.m. on Monday, November 10th, 1975, the Fitzgerald was close to the center of Lake Superior. She was 17 hours into her journey, a third of the way. But the storm was taking hold. They were just 12 hours away from tragedy. Ransom E. Cundy was one of three watchmen aboard. He was a father of two daughters, one of whom had been killed just the year before. The death had affected him badly. The man who had been a joker and prankster was now sad and withdrawn. Ransom could not swim a stroke. He said that if his ship went down, he would go to the bottom with her. The Fitzgerald was carrying over 26,000 tons of iron ore, roughly 15% more than her original design specs. Loading rules had been relaxed over the years. Great Lakes freighters were allowed to load deeper, making them more vulnerable in the high seas of autumn. Raymond Ramsey, one of the Fitzgerald's original designers, believes this was a contributing factor. The load line rules were changed to allow the ship to load deeper and she was allowed to go down about another four feet in order to carry more cargo. Even the two latest captains did say the ship handled differently. Well, of course it did. It was four feet further in the water. Strict regulations govern freeboard, the height a fully loaded ship must sit above the waterline. Easing of these rules meant the Fitzgerald went on her final journey with 3,600 tons of additional weight. She was sailing a meter lower in the water than on her first outing 17 years before. The extra water washing over her added stress to her hull. She was designed to bend, but there were limits. As the ship moved through the waves, she became less able to recover from the rolling and rocking forces of stormy seas. And there's another reason why the storm hit the Fitzgerald so hard. The Calumet is also a Great Lakes freighter. She's being cut up for scrap at an Ontario salvage yard, which gives the Fletchers a chance to examine her guts. The Fitzgerald was uh, 100 feet longer than this ship approximately, and 10 feet wider, uh, and I believe five or six feet higher. During loading, it's critical that freighters are kept level in the water. If the cargo weight is not evenly spread, the ship could list. The Fitzgerald's load was distributed over three massive holds, each one the height of a three-story building. But even properly loaded cargo can shift, triggering a list, while the ship is running low and unstable in stormy waters. And the Fitzgerald, loaded to the max, was being battered by waves. This giant cross-section shows how the Fitzgerald's internal structure could have made her even more unstable and vulnerable in a storm. These ships have what's called a centerline bulkhead. Right in the very center of the ship is a solid bulkhead, a solid steel wall that keeps water on one side of the ship or the other. It can only go as far as that center line bulkhead unless there right. was a leak in the bulkhead. So if the water's on that side, obviously she's going to tip this way. Correct. But it, and it's stopped from flooding from that side by a bulkhead underneath here. That's right. 
in the case of the Fitzgerald with the drain in the center, you can see how, if this ship begins to list, how much water a ship could take on. Yeah, let's let's that. draw one listing over to the side. Look how much water it could take on before it gets to the drain. Right. And in the case of the Fitzgerald, we know from the uh, communications from the captain that the ship couldn't get rid of its water that it had taken into the, the cargo holds. So on a ship this size, that amount of water could be even hundreds or even thousands of tons, right? Well, it would be thousands of tons, yeah. yes. Just one cubic meter of water weighs a ton. And the storm-tossed seas of Superior were raining down on the Fitzgerald the night she sank. The findings of the official inquiry attributed her sinking to a massive flooding of the cargo hold. But it went further to suggest that ineffective hatch closures were to blame and the crew at fault. Michael Eugene Armagost was the Fitzgerald's third mate. He was a good husband, 37 years old when he lost his life. The Fitzgerald was setting sail as his wife and young children arrived to surprise him and wave him off. They called to the ship's cook, who told them Mike was below deck resting before his shift. They never saw him again. His family say it is impossible the crew failed to secure the hatches. The relatives aren't the only ones who reject the inquiry's finding. The Fletchers are among the skeptics, but they want to test if open hatch catches alone could have doomed the ship. Marion Guzhabowski is a naval architect in Ontario. He has evaluated cargo hatches on freighters for more than 20 years and helped set the industry standards. Okay, Nick, let her rip. Let's bring on the water. Cargo ships sailing the Great Lakes must be safety inspected every year. The Fitzgerald's last inspection was October 31, 1975, 10 days before she sank. Water pressure is adjusted to match the force created by eight meter waves that the official report said the Fitzgerald encountered. The ship they're testing today is similar in structure. So the test should reveal how the hatch covers coped with the storm. The clamp style is the same. The actual physical type of hatch cover is the same as Fitzgerald. So it's a fair comparison. It's a fair comparison, yes. Okay, so there by one, here she comes. Warren, did you see any water coming through the middle of the hatch? Negative. I haven't seen any water yet. There is one clamp which is open, so we'll see if water is leaking through there. We're going to see water. She's coming right here. Any the water? Negative. Negative. Yeah, definitely a small amount of water came through. We sprayed for a half a minute, and you got enough water. This is about the equivalent as the amount of cream you put in a coffee. <laughs> uh, a couple tablespoons, not a couple teaspoons, but a, a couple tablespoons. Let's say we're going to sink a ship this size. Uh, not unless it was uh, getting sprayed like that for a few months or a year. Let's ramp it up. Let's take every other clamp off and see what okay. happens. So I'll grab the tool. The team want to see if the hatch can still do its job if a ship's crew left half the clamps undone. I don't think we'll get a ton of water coming through, but I think there will be a bit. There we go. We got a little bit of a squirt coming through there now. Is this coming more than before? I'd say at least double, maybe three or four times as much as before. We've taken every other clamp off. We've got the equivalent of 25-foot wave applied directly at the opening on the hatch cover. What's the most water that you saw come out? Maybe at the worst, uh, a liter a minute. Generally, on, on, as the waves were breaking on the deck, they were breaking like down here, right? So that means they wouldn't even affect us. We've gone to a huge extreme, and we've put the wave way up there which means that we actually compressed the gasket uh, with three meter of uh, water head. Right, which is, means it's only pushing it down it's more, pushing down. which is the equivalent of putting more clamps on. Yes. I'm not buying the idea that the Fitzgerald sank just because water got in through yeah. closed hatch cover. It just doesn't make sense. Yeah. Hey, War. Nice glasses. You like those? 
Yeah, where are yours? <laughs> I hope the Ministry of Labor comes to give you a big fine. <laughs> You were too young to remember, but in fact, you weren't born yet. But I remember the day the fit sank. I remember, you know, the mood of the people when they heard about a, a giant, what we considered modern lake freighter that sank because of a storm on Lake Superior. We didn't think that was even possible anymore. Yeah. Of course, this footage looked at the wreck. It was really hard to see anything in it. When the official inquiry was held into the sinking of the Edmund Fitzgerald, the only wreck footage available was low grade and grainy. But the team have accessed eight hours of high definition footage filmed in the 1990s, and they want an expert opinion on what it reveals. The Fletchers analyzed video of the Fitzgerald with Claude Daly, a specialist in the structure of ships. You can really see the structural breaks. This is way better resolution quality. And so, and this taken in the 90s, there's been no formal investigation hmm. since this was taken. The forensic video clearly shows the damage sustained by the Fitzgerald. Daly wants to look at the cargo holds where the freighter broke apart. And look at that, it's just totally... It's completely shredded. Mangled, yeah. Yep. It's like no man's land. I didn't realize just how severe the damage was in between the two sections. Look on here now. You see that, that scallop effect? That's not a modern uh, way of putting together steel. They thought at the time that this was reasonable, but we know now that in, that leaves a flaw at every one of those welds. It's a place for fracture to start. You wouldn't build a, a ship that way today. The welds create a weakness in the hull that could lead to cracking if overstressed. It adds weight to the theory of a surface breakup. We've got to look at that kind of evidence to try and figure out, did that happen on the surface or did it happen on the bottom of Lake Superior? Mm -hmm. My problem with thinking that the damage happened on the bottom, I can see a big crack happening in a, in a vessel that goes down to the bottom as one piece and then hits and cracks, okay, fine. But how do you get that much damage? Whereas I'm thinking if it's still on the surface when the crack happens and it's working now, right? The mm -hmm. waves, another wave, another wave, and it's working and it's, you know, it's grinding away. There, there has to be some reason for that. I mean, you know, it, it wasn't an explosion. There were some, it was natural, you know, wave forces and stresses that tore all that apart. The evidence suggests an extraordinary outside force broke the Fitzgerald apart, not cargo hatches leaking through human error. Dennis Hale was in the bow of another Great Lakes freighter, the Morel, when she broke in half on the surface. He could hear the sound of breaking metal above the ship's alarms. The noise that night was unbelievable. The wind was going through the wires. You could hear the sound of steam escaping, and the engines just, uh, you could hear them laboring. I heard a noise towards the stern, and uh, I looked, and the main deck was starting to tear. It was tearing real slow, like a piece of paper. And the next thing I knew, I was in the water. Hale paints an eerie image of the scene he witnessed on that storm-tossed lake. As the power went out on the bow, he watched the ship's stern steaming away into the night with her lights blazing. It was 13 years before both halves of his ship were found. They were more than eight kilometers apart. Like, imagine this crazy thing sticking up out of the water. Land isn't all that far away from here, and there is a lighthouse, so... Yeah. And if you think about it, where, this, where the bow sank, uh, relative to where the stern sank, it's in a line towards that lighthouse. It's hard to even imagine what would have been going through people's minds in that point, you know? I know these guys at least had a fighting chance. Their half of the ship was afloat and they had power and everything, but you know, the guys in the Fitzgerald, I don't think they were that lucky. A ship is a complex structure that fits together like a human skeleton. And each side of the breakpoint offers clues to its cause. the team prepare for a second dive on the Morel. This time, they're diving on her stern to investigate the breakpoint damage at the other side. 
to see how it compares to what can be seen on the Fitzgerald footage taken in the 1990s. They start their search at the Morell's cargo holds, where this ship ruptured just like the Fitzgerald. You can see the twisted metal and appreciate the forces that must have been exerted on this ship as she came apart. And the damage here is actually more defined than it was at the bow. The team notice an open hatch. It leads down to the engine room. Mike finds the ship's telegraph, a communication hotline from the stern to the pilot house on the bow. It's stuck beyond full reverse, supporting their theory that after the Morel snapped in two, the crew left in the stern may have tried to power her toward land in the hope of surviving. The Fletchers move through the engine room's maze of pipes, being careful not to get trapped in the debris. Then, high above the ship's waterline, they discover massive damage. The rear ladders and smokestack are twisted, crushed, and dented. It looks like wave damage, but this is 20 meters above the ship's safe waterline. The height of this evidence suggests gigantic waves smashed down on the stern of the ship. It's a clue that reveals the massive trauma waves can cause to ships as big as a Great Lakes freighter. Trauma they can now look for in the forensic footage of the Fitzgerald. Well, there's a lot of clues on the bow of the Edmund Fitzgerald here. Uh, this is the wheelhouse. This was way above the waterline. But still and, a uh, lot of damage for being way above the waterline. A good deal. <laughs> this visor over the, uh, on the front of the wheelhouse, it would have taken a considerable amount of impact from something. The reported wave conditions at around 25 feet would be really challenging for this vessel. But if there was some more extreme version, you know, if there was a really large wave that came by, some rogue wave, um, then uh, this kind of bow and side damage might well have been caused by a wave impact on the surface. Rogue waves. They were once dismissed as sailors' myths, now they're blamed as a major cause of shipwrecks around the world. On the Great Lakes, rogue waves can tower over 17 meters high. They're unpredictable and can come from unexpected directions. Some scientists believe they are born when a series of waves traveling at different speeds and directions sync up, merging into a gigantic wall of water. Could a freak wave have sunk the Fitzgerald? Tom Hultquist is a weather scientist, a specialist who has evidence for the Fletchers about rogue waves on the Great Lakes. Well, rogue waves exist, and they're actually defined by waves that are at least 2.2 times the significant wave height, which mm. in this case, with significant waves of 25 feet, you'd be talking 55 feet for a rogue wave, so extremely significant. Hultquist uses computer weather prediction models to reanalyze the storm that hit the Fitzgerald in November 1975. His study uses simulations and computer modeling and tracks warm, moist air from the Gulf of Mexico that collides with a mass of icy Arctic air. It reveals a perfect storm with hurricane force winds and giant waves that sweep across Lake Superior. What ended up happening is as they got into this eastern part of the lake here, the winds really shifted around more to the west and the northwest, so it had all of this space of Lake Superior over which to generate waves. So they were just really in the wrong place at the wrong time and wrong course. Everything was working against them. Yeah, the Fitzgerald couldn't have found itself in a worse location at a worse time. Storms can create much larger waves over long, open stretches of water. On Lake Superior, the wind can blow uninterrupted for more than 300 kilometers. It was a beast of a storm. Thank you. 
It was something that doesn't happen very often. They could have encountered a very significant wave beyond perhaps what some of the other boats out there saw. By midday, the storm is behaving like a tropical hurricane. As the storm takes hold, the Fitzgerald changes course and heads towards the Canadian shore, seeking shelter from the winds. The Arthur M. Anderson, another bulk freighter following the Fitzgerald on the lake, does the same. The storm is now whipping up the entire lake. The sky is low, gray, and waves are picking up strength and speed. Waves towering as high as 11 meters crash over the Anderson's pilot house. Then the waves move on, chasing the Fitzgerald across the lake. Bernie Cooper, who died in 1993, was the Anderson's captain. So those two seas were the biggest that we ever, uh, we ever had going down there. And it happened about 6.30 in the evening. And I just wonder if those two seas didn't catch up with the Fitzgerald. I just got to thinking about it afterwards. If those seas were that big, they rolled up his deck and was going to put his bow down under the water. Ernest Michael McSorley was master of the Fitzgerald. He'd been married for many years. Once the youngest master on the Great Lakes, he's now 63 years old and much respected for his years of experience. By 6.30 p.m. on November 10th, his ship, the Edmund Fitzgerald, is fighting for her life. Water is pouring into her ballast tanks, causing her to list. She's lost both radar antenna. It's dark. There's no sky, just violent winds and swamping waves. But the shelter of the Canadian shore is still more than an hour away. At 10 past seven with screaming winds and tons of water pounding her decks, the Fitzgerald has her last radio contact with the Anderson. We are holding our own. 10 minutes later, she is no longer visible and cannot be raised on her radio telephone. At 7.30, the storm begins to wane. One of the most sophisticated wave-generating tanks in the world is in the seafaring port of St. John's, Newfoundland. It belongs to the Canadian National Research Council's Institute for Ocean Technology. Navies and commercial shipping lines use it to test ship designs of the future. But today, the tank, containing 5 million liters of water, is being used to look into the past to evaluate what happened to the Edmund Fitzgerald. It's a scientific first, an experiment never undertaken here before. A scale model of the Fitzgerald is weighted to replicate the specific condition of the freighter as she battled the storm. Well, we know the Fitzgerald was already in trouble. It was listing, had some damage on the deck. They had lost some deck vents, and they were taking on water already. Yeah. So a ship that's already heavily laden with cargo, unstable, listing with these giant waves, it's, that's a lot for an old ship to take. Data from the NOAA scientists' recent weather study will be used to replicate the storm. The test will create the entire spectrum of waves that were possible on that night, including a rogue wave. They set up a high-speed camera to record what happens, and Warren sets up below the surface to capture the impact from beneath. Bruce Colburn is a naval architect who has studied waves and their impact on ships for more than 15 years. You'll see some big waves, some small waves, and it all depends on how the various components add together. 52 hydraulic underwater paddles, synchronized with the computer data, generate the waves. A rogue wave is essentially a statistical fluke that occurs when you get an unusual combination of waves that appear in one place. And they all add together and you get an extraordinarily large wave. And, and pure science and math and physics tells us that that will happen. That's right. Statistically, that should happen. The test replicates the range of wave heights the Edmund Fitzgerald actually encountered during her final hours. Running 20% lower in the water, the Fitzgerald would have been swamped by even the storm's smaller eight meter waves, stressing her hull to its limits. You can see a lot of the waves are coming up over the deck here, and we know that there were damaged ballast vents and things, so there's definitely gonna be a lot of water getting into the hull. But data from the NOAA team says a wave towering 17 meters or higher could have struck the Fitzgerald. So let's make it happen. That's okay. Here's a big one. 
there's our roadway. Wow, there's yeah. Oh, yeah, there we go. That was pretty washed over. The, that's yeah. right, yeah. There, the whole boat was yeah, a that, wash. that pretty there. well washed it from one end to the other. High-speed footage shows the rogue wave in all its deadly power. It towers over the stern of the ship, striking high on the pilot house, an impact that would cause damage the Fletcher saw in the HD footage of the Fitzgerald. Here's a big one. <laughs> Here it comes. Look at that. Picks the stern right up. Yeah. Rolls right across the whole deck and then just shoves the bow right under. Under that. Room. Yeah. Jam the wheelhouse straight under. Right. These ships, they're designed to take big seas. They know there's going to be big storms up there, but are they designed to take that freak, you know, one in a million rogue wave? The team have seen what the waves likely did to the Fitzgerald on the night she sank. Next, they plan to apply their data to the ship itself using a unique machine. The Fletchers are on board a $17 million marine simulator. It's one of just two such simulators in the world, and the only one with hydraulic motion. Here in Newfoundland, they can accurately replicate the conditions on the Fitzgerald's bridge the night she went down. When we got the data for the Fitzgerald itself, the lines, plans, the engine arrangement, the, uh, the weather model, we were really keen on uh, recreating the realism of every event. It's the first time this system is being used to investigate a marine accident. For all intents and purposes, you will be on board the Edmund Fitzgerald. Well, we're going to feel a gentle lifting now as the unit okay. rises up on its hydraulic, uh, hydraulic oh, yeah. legs. There it goes. The ship's simulator weighs roughly 25 tons. Its hydraulics are mounted on a six-degree motion base to precisely imitate the movement of the vessel through the storm. 3D projectors display a 360-degree view from the bridge. It holds more than 30 people, one of the largest simulators of its kind in the world, and processes massive amounts of complex data to create an ocean environment. This is typical of what you would find steaming along in about a two or three foot sea. That's right. Yeah, and you're not going to feel much in a big ship. No, like you're not going to feel very much. Heavily laden uh, and deep in the water. This is, this is a typical experience. Jim, if we can pick up the sea state now, we'd increase some of the, uh, the wind as well. The simulator also provides views from outside. This allows the Fletchers to see the effects of the storm on the entire ship. And with that kind of a load of iron ore on board, the vessel would have set pretty low in the water. One thing I'm really noticing is just how the waves are stretching out over the length of the ship. You know, you got one wave at the front and one wave at the back, and man, that would put a lot of force in the middle of the ship. We've got to look at that kind of evidence. Completely shredded. You're getting water that's covering the vents, uh, the vents into the tanks. We're twisting. And we're twisting. Yeah, you can feel the boat twist. Certainly. The hatch covers have to be doing their job, or you're in trouble. Oh, yes. The approaching seas uh, on deck, a lot of force uh, breaking off anything that's not really, really, really well secured. And we got to think that the Fitz was seeing at least at least 10 meter waves that night. Not all 10 meters, but the odd one would definitely be. With still the possibility that there was the odd freak or rogue wave. Jim, can we get the maximum sustained wind speed? Vessels reported wind speeds of 160 kilometers an hour, hurricane force, creating the perfect conditions for a rogue wave. meters high strikes the ship, smashing the deck and driving the pilot house underwater. 
It's a lot of forces, a lot of things are going on here right now. I could see where that would easily snap a ship like this in half. That would have been it. Nah, no ship that's fine. The Edmund Fitzgerald was beaten and battered by a November storm on Lake Superior. She took nearly a year to build, but just one day to destroy. On Monday, November 10th, 1975, she was rocked by violent winds and pounded by waves, dipping and lurching until the foundering ship was likely overwhelmed by a gigantic freak wave. A massive wall of water that bent and twisted her steel like a paperclip shredding 61 meters of her hull. She was the largest vessel ever to lose a battle against the Witch of November, an invincible Titanic lost along with 29 souls. The lake, it is said, never gives up her dead when the skies of November turn gloomy. With a load of iron ore, 26,000 tons more than the Edmund Fitzgerald weighed empty. That good ship and true was a bone to be chewed when the gales of November came early. 